you will help me this morning, I'm going to preach you something that I believe is right from God, it's right for now, and it is right for you. That's a good combination. But you got to help me. So when I say help, I mean give me some amens, go white boy, something, right? Get, stir the place up um, is what I'm going for this morning. So um, at the beginning of this year, th- th- this is not a series this morning, it's what I call a stand-alone message, which means it's not in a series, just stands out on its own. And, and so this is the message that uh, God kind of laid on my heart for a few weeks, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it with you uh, uh, this morning. Uh, and, and so here's the title. Um, it's called Unfree. It actually is a word that's in the dictionary, unfree. We call this year a year of what? Freedom. freedom. So it's a year of freedom. And so we've been teaching on that. I hope you've had some great experiences from the word of just learning what freedom's all about. So I want to talk today about being unfree. And the reason why I say that, because it, it is very possible for you to love Jesus, be on your way to heaven, but have some areas of freedom or some areas of your life that you lack freedom in. And I believe that it's the will of God that we are free indeed. That means totally free in every area of our life. And so um, we need a little bit of revelation to connect to, to make sure that we are um, walking in freedom in those areas. So that's what we're going to do this morning. I want to go to a scripture that we used earlier in the year. So um, transitioning out of what God's told us this year, and two weeks from today, I'm going to share with you I'm going to take two weeks and, and call it Vision Weekend, part one and part two, and share with you what God told me about your next year. Usually in August, God says, hey, here's what I want you to tell me about next year. But actually in April of this year, he told me, wanting to tell you, I had to wait all this time. So I only got two more weeks. It's going to be good. So a year of freedom, John chapter 8, verses 31, 32, and verse 36. So Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, so he's talking to believers, if, everyone say if. If you abide in my word, the Amplified says, if you hold fast to his teachings, and if you live in accordance with them, then you're his disciple. And then as a disciple, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Well, we shout about that in church, but what does that really mean? What that really means, if we're adhering to the word and living by the words of Jesus, it always produces freedom in our lives. And the Bible says, if you're a disciple, then you will know the truth. Jesus is the truth, and that actual truth begins to set us free in our life. The word know is an important word. We kind of bounce over it, but in the Greek language, it's actually a strong word. It's actually the word used for intercourse, so it's the most intimate knowledge. So it says this, uh, if you come to really know truth, truth will set you free. And then verse 36 says, so then if the Son liberates you or makes you a free man or woman, then you are unquestionably what? Free. Good stuff. If you know truth. So we could say it this way, this way, that your relationship with truth determines how free you are. Your relationship with truth really determines how free you are. When you see the word free, it means that you are liberated from something at the same time, you're liberated to something. So your relationship with truth actually determines if you're going to be free or not. Here's why. Here's what truth does. Truth actually exposes lies. So truth will expose lies. Now, a lie believed becomes a lie lived. And so you can love Jesus. You could be on your way to heaven but actually be living your life under this umbrella of a lie that you may or may not consciously know you're living. And so what God wants to do is bring truth, which is revelation. Revelation uh, means there was something that was always there, but there was something hiding it, and when it was exposed to you, I call it an aha moment. Aha. And the Bible says those moments of revelation, when God putting truth before you, and when you embrace it and live by it, it actually keeps you free. And it sets you free in different areas of uh, your life and different areas of my life. But if we don't have that revelation breaking through, we don't have truth, and guess what? We're bound in a lie or a trap, which is bondage. Now, here's why that's so important. The devil thrives, or I'll put it this way, his home field advantage is darkness and ignorance. That's his home field advantage. 
If something is in darkness or ignorance, that's his, that's, his, that's his area to thrive in. So what God wants to do is bring those things out of darkness and ignorance, expose them to light, expose them to truth, so there becomes what? Freedom comes out of it. So we, we can say it this way, an exposed and expelled lie always gives hope. If I can expose a lie and I can expel that lie, hope is the immediate product. So if we know truth, what does truth do? It, it sets us free. So we've learned this year that here's how you can get free in any area of your life. It, it's kind of these three little steps. One is we recognize. We're able to recognize an area of our life we're not free in, or this is an area of life that I, w- that I had a lie over me and I didn't know. It could have been religion. It could have been a parent who said, you're never going to amount to anything you weren't planned, you weren't expected, you're not going to live up to, you're not good for anything. Something spoken over us became a lie that we lived under our entire life until revelation came from the word or came from a speaker and you heard truth that said, you are good enough, you are more than enough. All of a sudden, then a lie comes into conflict with the truth. And if you embrace the truth and live accordingly, guess what? You get free from it, no matter what it may have been. So there's a moment of recognizing areas in our life that we're not free in, and then we repent. And usually repenting is taught this way, turn from something. And that's only part of the definition of revelation, or repentance, I should say. It means to recognize, be remorseful, turn from it, but turn to God. So repentance means turning from, but turning to God at the same time. So we recognize it, we repent over it, and then we just receive God's grace. We receive God's forgiveness. We receive God's empowerment. So we recognize it, we repent over it, and we receive. That's how truth works in our life. It's, it's, it's not a complicated formula, but that's how God's out to set us free. But he wants us free. So the Bible says this in 2 Corinthians. It says, do not be ignorant of the schemes of the devil. And so... It tells us, first of all, the devil has schemes. One place it says, don't be ignorant of his devices. So once again, what's the devil's home field advantage? Ignorance, darkness. Did you ever have a moment in your life where you came to service and maybe we preached on something and you're like, ah, I I see that now. I didn't see it before. What did it do? It empowered you because you got truth. You got some revelation. But the Bible says, don't be ignorant how the devil works. And here's how the devil works. The word devices or schemes, we could say it this way, don't be ignorant of his methods. Another way of saying it would be don't be ignorant of his roads. It means this, don't be ignorant of the roads the devil uses to get into your thinking. Did y'all hear that? He uses certain devices, certain techniques, and certain schemes to get into your thinking. Now, I would say it this way, the devil does have power, but he does not have ultimate power. Matter of fact, um, another place in the Bible, it says this. It says, we need to take every stronghold and pull it down. Here's what a stronghold is. A stronghold is anything in your life that you don't seem like you could get free from. But it's talking about your thinking. See, there are things that have been said to you, said over you, a lie you bought into. Because the Bible says the devil is the father of all lies. He's the liar. And he's been able to speak some lies into your life. You've believed them for years. They've stuck their strongholds. Some of it's just false religion. Some of it's not good teaching. Some of the things that people have said, things that have happened, and it becomes a stronghold. It means you can't hardly get rid of it. And the Bible said anything that raises itself up against the knowledge of God can become a stronghold. For example, someone may have said, you're not going to be good for anything. You're not going to um, be able to do that. You can't. You're not good enough. You're not weeded. All that stuff. And we start to believe it. It becomes a stronghold. And we live that lie our entire life. And the Bible says, if it's not what God said, we need to pull it down. How do you pull it down? With truth. You pull it down. There, 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 that, you expose it and you expel it from your life so you can have hope. So you can have truth. So you can have freedom. But here's what, the the devil is not creative. The devil is a counterfeiter. Here's how this works. Something happens in your life, a painful event. It could be some, uh, an incident, incident, it could be a circumstance. It could be something that someone spoke over you. 
and it's painful, but the pain that happened is not the worst part. It's the wound that is left that the devil grabs a hold of and magnifies. Put, put it this way. Um, if you have some garbage somewhere, have you ever noticed rats are attracted to the garbage? It's how the devil works. It's how his demonic forces work. They're attracted to the wounds and the garbage of our life. And then they start uh, writing on those wounds and emphasizing those wounds and magnifying those wounds into a place where we're stuck in a stronghold. And God says, I want you to be free from those things. So when we apply truth, it begins to expose and expel those strongholds. That's what freedom is. See, as you think, you go. Bible actually says that as a man thinketh, so is he. So a stronghold is what? It's on the inside of us. It's, a, it, it's thinking that we have. And the Bible said we, got, we have to expose truth to it and expel it, and freedom follows. But there are a lot of times some wounds that the devil has wrote on and continue to speak over your life and set into your life, you're not pretty enough, you're not smart enough, you're not educated enough, you're never, you're never, and he rides on the wounds. So because someone said something or you believe something, now he puts that lie with it, and now you start to believe it, and you start to live your life accordingly. The only thing that can break that is the power of the truth. If, if, if all along you've been felt to be a loser, then the Word of God comes along, and the Word of God says you are more than a conqueror. You are more than victorious. You are the apple of my eye. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You are prosperous. You are blessed. You are healed. Then the word comes into conflict with a lie. That lie has to be pulled down. Are you with me this morning? But sometimes we don't know about the lies. They're just told to us, and we start to live under them. So I, I want to expose a lie and get you free in some areas this morning. So let me, let me say this. Um, I might get wound up. I did in the first experience. I, I, just, I just want to get that out there and warn you, first of all. Um, but I'm talking in two different directions this morning. Number one, I'm talking to everybody in a general sense. And number two, I'm talking to men especially and directly this morning. So are you all ready to go? All right, I said all that to just set up where I'm going. Y'all ready? Um, Let's go to the book of Mark, and this is a parable that Jesus was teaching. And, and let's go to verse 20. It says this, One time Jesus entered into a house, and the crowds began to gather again, and soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. Well, what were they doing? Well, in context, he's casting out demons. Verse 21, When his family heard what was going on, they tried to take him away, and they said he's out of his mind. Can you imagine that? They thought Jesus was losing his mind. He's so busy casting out demons. Verse 22, but the teachers of religious law arrived from Jerusalem, and this is what they said. Well, he's possessed by Satan. Can you imagine saying that about Jesus? Um, he's possessed by the devil. That's where he gets his power to cast out demons. Now, so they accused Jesus of being full of Satan. Well, what, how would Jesus respond to that? I love it. Jesus called them over. And he responded by giving them an illustration. He's about to prove a point. Jesus said, well, how can Satan cast out Satan? That's stupid, right? He's casting out devils, and they say, well, you're full of a devil. Jesus said, that doesn't make any sense. He said, a kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. Similarly, a family splintered by feuding is going to fall apart. Satan can't cast out Satan. And then he goes on, he says, if Satan is divided and fights against himself, how can he stand? He wouldn't survive. Then Jesus said, let, let me take this further. He said, who is powerful enough to enter a house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Only someone who's even what? Stronger. Someone who could tie him up and plunder his house. What's Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying that you're the house there was a strong man in your life. The only way a strong man could be removed is someone stronger could come and bind him and plunder the goods. What Jesus is saying is there was a time in your life where the devil had you bound 
So it had to be someone stronger than the devil, which is Jesus, that could come, bind him, and take the goods back. Now, now look, Luke, Luke says it in chapter 11, same thing, he's talking a little different. He said, but if I'm casting out demons by the power of God, then the kingdom of God is a, has arrived among you. When a strong man is fully armed and guards his palace, the possessions are safe. Until someone even stronger would attack and overpower him and strip him of his weapons and carry off his belongings. So now, in the book of Luke, Luke is saying a strong man is rooted and is armed and he is strong. It's going to take someone stronger to plunder him. And the good news is Jesus is the stronger man, right? So let me take that parable because what it means is there are some things enthroned on our thinking that's keeping us captive. So those things that are keeping you captive, a stronger man, a truth is stronger than a lie, has to bind the lie for you to be free. Jesus is stronger. Y'all get that? He's the stronger one. He's strong enough to bind the devil, to release you, tie him up, and plunder what he did in your life. I want to look at this from two angles. What happens when we're living unfree? That's one angle. The other angle is, I believe this with all of my heart, that there is a strong man, Jesus is stronger, but I also believe this, God put, and it's the will of God to put some strong men in our churches. So one angle I want you to hear this morning, I'm talking about the devil is the strong man. The other angle I want you to hear, what hap what's happened to all of our strong men? If they're bound, the church is being plundered. Our society is being plundered. Can y'all handle it if I teach it from two angles? So I'm going to say some things today that I need to say this first of all. Usually if you teach what I'm going to teach, it gets real condemning, but I want to put grace in it because I believe everything I'm saying today, we can correct and we can do. And I also want you to hear this this morning. I am not speaking that men are above women. Men and women are partners. Y'all got that? But I do believe there's a responsibility that God put on and gave men that we're to be responsible for, and I believe we've been acting irresponsible. So here we go. So what happens when we're living unfree? Let's look at a, a scripture all the way back in the book of Genesis, and then I'll give you some points as God gave them to me. Um, Genesis chapter 1, God said, let's make man in our image according to our likeness and give man dominion over all of the birds, the cattle, all the things that creep on the earth. So God made man in the image of God, and he did what? He gave him dominion. So God created man in his image, and he created him the male and female, and God blessed them. Everyone say blessed. So God created man, gave him an assignment, and then he blessed him to be able to walk out the purpose of God. And God said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, take dominion. These are strong words. In the very beginning, God made Adam and Eve, and he said, hey, I want you to repopulate, replenish, take dominion, subdue the earth, and I'm blessing you to be able to do it. And we know the rest of the story, though. One day... God comes into the garden, and he can't find Adam and Eve. Now, God had said to Adam and Eve, it's all yours except for one tree. Do y'all wish that they would have never ate from that one tree? I do too. But one day, God comes into the garden, and he's looking for Adam and Eve, and he can't find them. He used to walk with them every day, and God's calling out to them, and he's like, where are you? And they said, well, we hid from you because we were what? We were naked. And God said, who told you you were naked? Who was it that said you were inadequate? Who was it that said that you were rejected? Who was it that told you you should be hiding when I called you to dominate? And Eve said, uh, that serpent tricked me. Well, the Bible said the serpent came to Eve and said, did God really say don't eat? See, the devil comes, and the devil's after one thing. The same thing he's after in our country right now is the Word of God. There are two things they're after right now, your guns and the Bible. 
That's true. The devil's after the word of God in your life. That's what he's after in your life. The word of God. The Bible says take the word of God, hide it in your heart, speak it, live it, breathe it. And the devil's after the word because he knows the power that's in the word believed. And so he comes to Eve. He said, God didn't really say that. So she did what? She ate of the apple. And then God turned to Adam. And Adam said, uh, you know that woman you gave me? She gave me the apple. Well, Adam could have said no. Somehow Eve got him to eat the apple. You want a little bite of this apple right here? <laughs> Whatever it took, it didn't take long. They both ate the apple that they weren't supposed to eat. But what if they wouldn't have eaten that apple? How would life have been different? See, we can live unfree. And if we're living unfree, I want you to see these three things that will show if we have areas of our life where, uh, where we're unfree. And we can correct these. Generally, we all are guilty. Specifically, guys, we're very guilty. So an unfree life is passive, not present. Did you all get that? An unfree life means we're living passively instead of being present. Here's what I mean by that. What if Adam, we, we can say, well, Eve ate the apple, but what if Adam had been doing what Adam was purposed to do, he would have been present, not passive, with Eve. Did you all get that? She was too passive. Remember the difference when the serpent tempted Jesus, and Jesus' response every time was, it's written, the word says, my father said, she had a, he had a present answer, not a passive response. Eve was passive. Adam was passive. Here's what happens when, we're, when we get in an unfree state or what causes us to be unfree. See, freedom means I'm free to some things and I'm free from some things. We're liberated. When we're not living free, we're living passive. Not present. So let me talk to guys for just a moment. Because I feel like there's a reason why we often become passive. Actually, I believe this is for all of us, guys specifically. For a lot of us, there have been a father vac vacuum in our life, which means this, a father was absent. And if a father is absent, it spells one word to you, and that word is rejection. And when that label is given to us as rejection, not good enough, can't do, what does it do? It, it makes us passive. And passivity breeds torment. Think about this. If there's no father, there's actually no family. If there's no family, there can be no faith. L listen to this crazy statistic. Um, so they say if moms, and let me just say, bless you moms, a lot of you having to be single moms, and know this, God will grace you to do it if you're in that state. But some of you had to be mom, dad, and everything in between and, and, and bless you for being that because a guy was absent, a father was absent. But listen to these statistics. They say if mom brings their children to church, there's a certain percentage, it's not real high, but there's a certain percentage that their child will stay in church and live a moral, faith-filled life. But then they say if mom and dad both bring the children, that statistic elevates. But now listen to this. If a father brings the children, the statistic is even higher than if mom and dad both bring them. Well, that seems a little, like that wouldn't make sense. So what it's saying is even if a dad just comes and brings the children, the impact on the children is, get this, 12 times more impactful. Now, that's not to say moms stay home. <laughs> that's to say the impact that children need, the impact that a church needs, the impact that a community needs is we need men to show up, be present. That's the solution to passivity. Men, put your big boy pants on, and show up and be present. 
be a dad, be a husband. I believe you need to show up in your home. And I, need, and I believe you need to show up in God's house. That's not to say that, ladies, you do not have a prominent place in the church. I'm not, please don't walk out of here and think that. I, I'm, you know, we're, we're partners, so nobody think that. This isn't like men's right. It's not one of those messages. It's just to say there's some responsibility we have. I believe this. If we show up and say, hey, guys, if we show up and say, hey, we're having special services at the church, special speakers. Guys, we shouldn't ask our wives, oh, I think we ought to go to that. Guys, we, you know what we need to do? We need to show up and say, we're taking the family to church. Because they might just say something. They might just sing something. God might just show up and do something we need to hear. You don't have to love me yet. I'll get there at the end. <laughs> we, if we have a work day at the church, men ought to be what? I'm there. I'm just saying, men, we need to show up. I'm, I'm just examples. But we need to show up because men in our culture are too passive. We've not become present. And there's a reason for it. There's a vacuum. I get it. But we need to show up. Here's the second thing of an unfree life. We're not only passive, we're, we're, we're not passive, not present. We're plundered, not protecting. We're plundered, not protectant. So if you're not present, guess you what? You won't be. You won't be protectant. And if you're not protecting, guess what? You'll be plundered. The devil comes to what? Kill, steal, and destroy. They say that one out of every four families in America is missing the dad. Here's what happens because the dad's missing. Poverty increases, unruly teenage behavior increases, incarceration increases, unwanted pregnancy increases, abuse, alcohol and drug abuse, dropping out of school, emotional, physical health, all those factors, risks are through the roof. And you know what? In our community, we've got problems, we've got addiction problems, but behind it all, we've got some family problems, and behind that is a spiritual problem. And I believe there's a world looking at it looking for a solution, and I believe the solution is in the hands of God's children. We've become too passive, and we become less protectant. Now, this is where I almost got in trouble in the first experience. So I'm not going to behave again if you'll just stick with me for a moment. I, I, I believe this with all of my heart. I believe that what happens in the natural is a mirror of what's happening in the spiritual. And I believe this. I believe there is a war. Listen, guys, listen to me. There's a war against masculinity. There is a war against masculinity. We want men to be passive. See, men are, men are what? They're made to be protectors. Actually, they say this, that when men are confident, you know what? They're competitive. Now, granted, we, just let me, let me say this. Um, there's healthy competition and there's unhealthy but I just, I'm just going to say a couple things. I, I, I said I was going to behave, but I'm not. <laughs> and I'm not doing this for giggles. I'm just I'm trying to prove some points here, right? So um, what do we see in our culture today? I, we see it everywhere. We see men being defamed and degraded. And I just word it this way. It's a war against masculinity. I, I, I think we're seeing it happen because there is a massive movement of gender confusion. There's a massive movement of gender reclassification. We can't even call them boys or girls now. They're like wee babies or whatever. That, I mean, guys, this is, it's absurd. It's the culture's way of thinking. I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. You don't have to agree with me. Anybody like sports? I say this every weekend. I'm watching football. And I told my wife, I said, they need to put skirts on these guys because they won't let them tackle each other and hit each other anymore. Now, I don't want somebody hurt, but come on, it's, it's a game of gladiators. <laughs> and, and, and hear this, we, we are, we're saying, hey, here's all you need. Thanks for coming out, little Joey. Here's your trophy. We don't play to win. Now, you should get a trophy for being on the team. Don't take me wrong. But the Bible clearly says, run as if you're pursuing the prize. 
That's why the Bible uses all this language about war, and it uses all this language about athletics, and it, it says things about winning. It says you're more than a conqueror. You're more than victorious. And we live in a society that's like, here's your trophy. And Philippians says, you go after the prize. You lay everything behind you, and you pursue the prize. But what happens? We're, we're downplaying the pursuit. We're making people passive, and we're, we're not protecting the things of God. Think about this. Okay, so where I live over the last few months, there, there have been um, several attempted break-ins. A uh, neighbor got his car stolen. They've got people on video footage trying to break in. And so um, my, my, my response to that is a few things. One, um, I have a big dog. Two, I have an alarm system. And if need be, I will defend my territory with a weapon. And I'm, this is not a message about guns, but I'm just saying, why? Because I'm going to protect the wife I love and the two girls I have at home. Now, wouldn't this be, this, this happens, I don't know what your wife is like. My wife's not here. She's watching my live stream. Love you, honey. Um, <laughs> this happens all the time. She'll be like, did you hear that? <laughs> You're laying there trying to sleep. Did you hear that? She hears stuff all the time. Did you hear that? No. <laughs> and it's immediately followed with this. Aren't you going to check it out? Yes, that's what I'd love to do right now is get up and check that out. <clears throat> but if you knew someone was about to invade your God-given territory and you just leave the door open, come in, just plunder, I'm not being protected. No, every dad, every husband would be like, I'd do whatever to protect them. We can't be passive. We've got to protect the word of God. We've got to protect our family. We've got to protect the house of God. And I'm talking in a spiritual sense. You know, a, a, a few, several months ago, my doorbell quit working. And I got to be honest with you, I, I'm not, I can't fix much like that kind of stuff. I'm just like, I tried everything. I bought a new door. I couldn't find the wires. I finally, I did the best thing I could think of. I saw at the store one day a wireless doorbell. And if it says wireless, I'm in because it just sounds awesome, right? <laughs> so I put this wireless doorbell up. It's working. I'm like, I'm, you know, Bob the Builder here. And so all of a sudden, like into the, a couple weeks later, about four nights in a row in the middle of the night, like 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, the doorbell rings. Well, come to find out what was going on, there was a, a signal interference that happened. But this ha How many know at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning your doorbell shouldn't ring? But the doorbell rings, so I'm on alert. You know what I mean? You're, 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 you're taking the club or whatever, and you're going, I, I, I had to go to the front. I wasn't sure what was going to be there when I got there, and I'm going, oh, Jesus, Jesus you know, who's, at, who's at the door? But there had to be a response. And let me tell you, there's a signal going off in the spiritual realm right now. And we need some men and some women to quit being passive. Come on, somebody. And it's time to what? Show up. And it's time to what? Step up. Now, I wish there was a, a two, three, you know, make you feel good to have a sip of coffee formula. But it just comes down to this. It's time to quit being passive. Think about this. What you're passive about, you're less protectant over, and you will get plundered. Let me give you the other one. So an unfree life is passive, it's not present, it's plundered, it's not protected. And this may sound a little weird, but an unfree life is impotent. It's not reproductive. What did God say in the very beginning? I make man and I make woman. And he said, go reproduce, replenish, dominate. And he says, I'm going to bless you to do it. So he blessed him to do it. So God just began to put a couple of things on, on, on my heart. And this is going to sound like a really weird word, but what I see happening spiritually, in, in a spiritual sense, that guys, what the enemy's doing is he's castrating our men of God. And I, I know what that word means, but so I, just, I, I wanted to see the definition. Here's what the definition means. To deprive of strength, efficiency, and power. To deprive of strength, efficiency, and power. Here's why this is so important, because we need more spiritual fathers. Now listen to me, in our churches, and we're losing them. And if we lose our spiritual fathers... And spiritual father doesn't mean you have to be 80 to be that. But we need some men and women 
of God, but we really need some men to become spiritual fathers that say, you know what, I'm done being passive. I'm going to protect this God thing. And I want to reproduce into the next generation. I want to reproduce the seed of spiritual things into the next generation. Because if we don't, we lose the next generation. They say we're reaching like 4% of the next generation. And it's a generation without, in the natural, many without fathers. And that, that's the natural result of a spiritual issue. So this is the way I word it. We, we have to show up, we have to step up, and we need to stand up. There, there's a spirit working today in the world. It's a spirit, um, I'll give it a name. It's a spirit that the, it, was, it was a literal person in the Old Testament. And it's a person at the end of the Bible, it's a spirit. And it's Jezebel. Um, Jezebel is a spirit of manipulation, intimidation, and control. Now, now, now hear me out on this, okay? See, y'all thought you are going to get a nice Thanksgiving message, right? It's a spirit working in our culture today. It's a spirit that thrives on the wounds and the rejection of people. So when you take men who are being rejected and told they're not good enough, or you take women as well, and you put a label of rejected over them, hear, hear me out. This is why truth is so important. You will live under that label unless truth sets you free. Because here's the worst thing that happens is you become a victim of circumstance and a victim of culture, and that spirit keeps you in that place. But when you get revelation and truth, the Bible says you can be set free. Now, now the Bible says this, that Jezebel was a Phoenician queen who uh, married the Hebrew king. And she had almost a thousand false prophets that she kept at her table. We've heard all about that story. But the Bible says she kept eunuchs. And let me explain to you what a potential biblical eunuch is and then tell you literally how this plays in. So uh, when you see the word eunuch, I'm not making this stuff up. You'll see how relevant this is. It could be a male who is a drag queen. It could be a male who identifies himself as a female or he has re-identification surgery. I mean, what, what, what is in our society? I mean, we, or in this particular instance, here, here's how this would work. So there would be a battle. Men were captured and they were made into slaves. And when they were made into slaves, they did a few things to them. First of all, they castrated those men. They changed their name. They put them through pagan training and put them at the king's table to eat of the king's food and the king's drink. So you see how this plays out in culture? What the enemy wants to do is to spiritually castrate you, change who God said you were, train you in the culture's training and put you at the table of society's meal. The thing about that is, obviously a male who's castrated cannot reproduce. I just want to free you, you this morning to say, don't buy into culture's training. And don't buy into the things that are said over you. Buy into what Jesus said over your life. Buy into what Christ commanded over your life. No matter what's happened, you may have been a victim at one time, but Jesus has this way of turning victims into victors. He has this way of taking a mess that happened to you and making a miracle out of it and giving you a ministry. Now, here, here's the deal in Revelation. See, Jezebel was a person. It can be an attitude and it can be a spirit. In the book of Revelations, it says this. Jesus said, I have this against the church in Thyatira. It says, you have tolerated Jezebel. The only way you defeat Jezebel is you have to stand up to it. You have to step up to it to defeat it. And 
Jesus said to the church in Thyatira, I've got this again. You keep tolerating that spirit. We may not be able to change everything across the country somewhere, but I believe we can change what happens in your house. We can change what happens in this house. We can change what happens in this community. And we can change what happens inside of your heart. But we can't tolerate that spirit. We cannot, listen to me, God's people. Listen to me, God's men. We cannot be passive anymore. We've got to be present. We cannot be unprotected anymore or we'll continue to be plundered. We cannot any longer stay unproductive because the next generation is counting on us. I can't preach any softer because the next generation is counting on us. I can't tell you, I can't say thanks for coming. Um, give you a little devotion, go home, hope you get through the week, we'll see you next Sunday. Can't do that. Got to preach you up so you can go out there and defeat the spirit of Jezebel. You can go to your home and defeat the spirit of passivity. You, you, you can show up in church. Don't send your kids to church. Bring them to church. Show them how to worship. You know how they're going to watch you? You know how they're going to learn to worship? They're going to watch him when he leads. They're going to watch the men around the room like, they're going to watch me if I worship. You teach what you know, you reproduce who you are. Y'all get that? I can teach you what I know, but I can reproduce what I am. Now, I want you to think about this. I'm almost done. Y'all doing good? Let's, let's go through some examples. Think about spiritually. If we become passive in our spiritual life, we stop protecting it, it gets plundered, and our spiritual life becomes unproductive. And hey, sometimes we go through some ruts, sometimes we go through some dry moments, but sometimes we get to the place where it's like, I'm, I'm burnt out, I'm fried, I'm, I'm getting nothing, I'm just, uh, could it be we became too passive in our prayer life, in our word life? Okay, how about this financially? We can become too passive. Because the Bible actually says this, if you're a giver and a tither, God does what? He puts a hedge of protection around. But if we become passive in that area, we get plundered. We're not reproducing financially like the Bible says we can. How about this relationally? We get real passive in relationship. Things get plundered, our marriages get plundered, our lives get plundered. We're not protecting some things. Don't have a hedge around some things, and it gets unproductive. Our health, it can happen in our health. How about, how about this? It, it can happen in our attitudes. We get passive. Because the Bible, there's a few attitudes the Bible says it talks about. It talks about an attitude of joy, attitude of faith. What if we get passive in those areas? Guess what? It gets plundered. What happens if your, if your joy gets plundered? What's Nehemiah say? The joy of the Lord is your what? If you start losing, your, if, your, if your joy gets plundered, guess what? You're not very strong. We're left, left unproductive. When all the way back in the beginning of the Bible, God said, I want you to be productive, replenish the earth, dominate and I'm going to bless you to be able to do it. But the devil talked them out of the blessing. They were too passive with the blessing. And they didn't protect the blessing. And they did not reproduce the blessing. But thank God Jesus came. Because the same blessing in the garden is the same blessing for today. Because Jesus went and got it back. Amen. And I'm so thankful for the word of God and the blessing of God. And I'm, I'm so thankful for the grace of God that it, it, although we fumble around sometimes and we stumble around sometimes, grace helps us correct some things. And so the way I see it this morning, we need to make just a few alterations and a few connections, move out of passivity. It's time to show up. Start putting your protectors out there around the things of God, around your heart, around your family, around this church. You know, we actually have a protection team at the church. I don't know if you ever knew, we have a protection team. It's the guys, they watch, they watch a monitor. 
they will protect you if something happens. Well, don't you trust God? I trust God 100%. I don't trust people. I think we ought to have a bunch more men on that protection team. Ladies, you bring your kids to church. Isn't it good to know right now you're being protected? Yes, we trust God. We need to fill that team up with some more men. Why? Because we need to protect the house of God. Why? We want our women and children to be able to come in here and get full of God. We want God to be God in the service and not be concerned with some other things. Hey, I, I'm not, this is some black and white stuff today. It's some nuts and bolts. It's some old school stuff. But I, I just want you to know we need to show up. We need to step up. We need to stand up. There's a promise when Jesus was talking through John about the church in Thyatira. He said this. He said, if you'll stand up to this spirit, I'm going to give you an anointing of power in that area. It's what God always does. When we whoop something, he gives us power in that area. And I see this. I see this happening in, in marriages. You'll see a very controlling, dominant female, and the husband has gotten real wimpy and passive, and the wife jokes about it. That is all out of line. That's that spirit. It's partnership. It happens in our culture. You can see it happens against churches. There was a few years ago, some things came against this church. God showed me what it was. He said, it's the spirit of Jezebel. I didn't know much about it. I started studying my guts out, praying. And this is what God said. He said, you need to stand against it. If you don't, it'll rule. And I, I'll be honest with you. It about did me in. It about did my family in, but I'm so glad we stood against it because now I see it every time. As soon as I see it coming, and we've dealt with it from time to time if it started raising it because we won't have it. Why? We're not going to be passive about it. We're gonna, this is the thing I told God I would do in the middle of all that. He, he gave me this. He said, you can protect some friendships or you can protect the church. And I said, I'm going to protect the church. I don't want to lose friendship, but I'm going to protect the church. I had to do that as the pastor. Guys, you need to do that. As the head of your homes, as men in this church. Now, I know you came to get your Thanksgiving service today, but um, I had to give you what God gave me. My heart for you is to live free. And the Bible says, if it's the son who liberates you, you are free indeed. You gotta be free from those lies. The lies that you keep hearing, that you have to stay broke, you're not good enough, You've made too many mistakes. You've got too much of a yesterday. Those are all lies. Those are all lies. You're from West Virginia. It's poverty stricken there. It's a cloud of darkness. It's oppression. Blah, blah, blah. Those are lies. I mean, there's some truth to that. But if the stronger man is stronger than the strong man, my God's bigger than the strong man. His word's bigger than, the Bible said he can come in and bind a strong man and plunder what the enemy, God, God wants to plunder what the enemy stole from you. How many got some stuff God stole from you? He might have stole your kids, your marriage, your job, he might have done something. I believe 2019 is a year God's going to start showing some stuff back up that the enemy stole from you. I, I mean, listen, to this. there's some unfinished, God spoke to me, I'm getting ahead of myself, God spoke to me a few months ago and he said there's some unfinished stuff. And he said, what do you want me to finish in 2019? I started making a list. You better start making yours. I'm going to show you how to get it fixed. So here's how we're going to end this today. I, I, I need every man to stand because I want to speak some stuff over you. And then we'll have the lady stand in a moment. You guys get something good today? <clears throat> Father, I thank you for every man standing. They might be standing at, at home. They might be stood in the first experience. They might be standing right now. And God, I, I, I speak over every man in here, and I break a spirit of passivity. And I break that spirit that's kept them unproductive. And God, I pray that your word rises up in them, and you stir them to show up, stand up, and step up. And God, I pray that this church will be known for men who lead the way, men who are moved by your word, and not what culture's lying to them about. And I release them from everything spoken over them. Every bit of rejection they've ever felt. God, you've never rejected them. You've always accepted them. And God, if you be for them, it doesn't matter what came against them. And God, I release them into your best. Let, let, let's all stand. Father, I thank you for this entire...